So you should see in a second, John. All is recording. Yeah. Dave is so excited he's left the building. Yeah, he's run off. Which makes for great podcasting. Thanks, Dave. <sighs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another E5 podcast. I am your chair for this amazing roller coaster of exciting engineering debate, and I am as ever joined by my illustrious, beautiful, and intelligent tag team partners. Introduce yourself, chaps. Yep. Hello, I'm JW. And it's me, Dave, Sparky Ninja here. John the Wise Ward. Mm. I'd be like a Lord of the Rings character almost, couldn't it, really? And David, the Sparky Ninja, which yeah. could be in a Bruce Lee movie. Yeah. And you're already playing with screwdrivers. Come on, this Sorry. is an engineering debate. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. so yeah. we have a list of podcasts and webinars, and we are working through it. Um, and we today's one is very strangely going to be interrupted by something else. Mm. So today's one, we were just going to have a chew the fat debate about electricity at work regulations, because we always do. We're constantly debating them, just not recording it. So we thought we'd just kind of reiterate that debate but before we do there was a, 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 was a there was a, a a revelation an incident whatever you want to call it within our industry which has sent small shockwaves through it yeah i guess i guess mainly because it was a this doesn't normally happen kind of thing mm, really this doesn't normally happen yeah. and it involved an electrician getting prosecuted mr ward would you like to give us a summary of the details please yeah this was uh well the actual case was on the 20th of September 2021. Um, essentially, an electrician went to a property, and this was back in 2018, did the ICR, only took them less than an hour, apparently, and then they said, yeah, it's all fine, no problems, and that was that. Subsequently, Pembrokeshire uh, Training Standard sent another electrician in, of one of their own, to do an inspection at the property, and they found that there was a whole pile of problems, and in fact, it basically needed a total rewire. And the electrician in question was prosecuted, and they were prosecuted under the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations 2008, basically for engaging in a commercial practice which was misleading by describing the general condition of the extra installation as a property as satisfactory, which was untruthful. And they were fined £1,500 and had to pay £1,000 towards cost and £100 of uh, some oh. statutory surcharge payment. So Basically, they did the SCR, which was a load of old junk, and then we found out about it and uh, had to pay a fine. So, so this isn't this isn't that somebody has actually had a nasty incident and it's a prosecution from a potential life threatening situation. This is actually more simply that somebody has provided a service and actually not done the service, and you know, hence unfair trading. They've just basically balls it up. Yeah, is that that's right? it. That's it. And essentially what was the, the circumstance of this was that the person was buying a property, a house. They had this person do an ESAR and obviously they bought the house believing it was all fine and lovely. And then subsequently found out actually, no, it's a load of old rubbish and it mm. in fact needs a whole pile of work. So it, there was no actual injury or problem there. It was just the fact of someone was told something which was untrue, which subsequently uh, may have affected what they paid for it or incurred extra work being done. It's an interest it's an interesting precedence because you know this does mean moving forward we've got this idea that even though you may have persons doing drive-by eicrs we we often would not hope but we'd, we'd, we'd anticipate that some people may get hurt in some, at some period of time where there's you know false information or you know a lack of competent work but with evidence that just sheer shoddy workmanship or poor efforts or just lying outright with regards to the data this does suggest that action could be taken even still yeah i mean the the, the actual circumstance of this is that this this woman apparently was going to buy this property the asa was done first for the vendor she then buys it she then gets her electrician to go in and put some extra sockets and things in mm. this electrician has a quick look and says well this is obviously no good it's all these list of problems and it needs rewiring and then the council gets involved and sends the third electrician in, which is one of theirs. 
and uh, subsequently they bring this prosecution and eventually obviously it's like a couple of years later it's now been uh, found guilty of basically just misleading people by writing a load of tosh on a bit of paper well uh, for those listening or watching, um, what we're discussing here is is commonly known in the trade vernacular as the drive-by EICR. John, just just to be clear here, where did you get the facts that you've just read us from? This came from Pembrokeshire Trading Standards, and it's on their own actual website, so you can uh, okay go there and have a look. And it's been reported in various places, but this is actually from the. Uh, place itself so it's it's from the horse's mouth isn't it yeah. so yeah i found a pembrokeshire western telegraph uh, article written by a trainee journalist which had some of the information this has a lot more because before we started recording we were asking was it prosecuted under the electricity at work regulations or something else now just before we move on to the AWR, this consumer protection from unfair trading regulations 2008 statutory instrument 1277 so this is going to form part of a secondary piece of legislation interestingly where you've got part two you've got regulation seven aggressive commercial practices misleading actions regulation five regulation six misleading emissions um, regulation four prohibition of the promotion of unfair commercial practices you've then got offenses part three offenses relating to unfair consumer practices um, and then there's regulations. A trader is guilty of an offence if he does X, Y and Z. Penalties, time limits, prosecutions, due diligence defence. So they've got due, every single set of regulations as a due diligence. We, we have the regulation 29, Article 32 of the Fire Reform Order. And then this is regulation 17. And it says, ironically, virtually the same in any proceeding against a person for an offence under regulation. Insert, 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 insert. Is it a defence for a person to prove that the commission offence was due to a mistake? Reliance on information supplied to him by another person, the act or default of another person, an accident or another cause beyond his control, that he took all reasonable precautions and exercised all due diligence to avoid the commission of such an offence by himself. Put that into context of an EICR self-employed electrician. Mm. This is your due diligence offence because what's happened now, ladies and gents, is this is a precedent in law. This is the first known prosecution for one of these substandard electrical installation condition reports. Now that this has happened, a lot more people, if they complain about the substantive lack of quality in their reports, they could now show other building control departments or trading standards there is a method and a means to fine and prosecute. So it's worth, well, that's why I've just read this out, the due diligence mm. defence, because basically you have to do all due diligence. You can't use the finance defence. This is why you as the competent inspector need to set your standards, set your pricing structure right. Don't join the race to the bottom. Um, it's actually, I, I'm, I'm, do you know what? I'm just blown away by the headers in this, to be honest with you. Um, there's a lot of powers to, you know, um, enter premises mm. and do all that good stuff. Innocent publication of advertisements, misleading action. It's a fascinating set of, oh my goodness me, some of these regulations are long. I'm just reading it now for those it's, who are listening, by the way. It's, it's important to add at this point that, you know, putting some kind of measure in place, they are, oh, if they went with a approved or registered electrician to do the ICRs, they'd be able to guarantee that's not going to be evident because in this case, the electrician at the time was with Stroma. Is that right? He was with Stromer at the time, this um, electrician, this uh, drive Did by. Did you say Stromer? Yeah. The, um, Tesco uh, value. Tesco value. Um, That's the nickname. So, you know, having that assurance from the perspective of, you know, you know, a, an estate agent or a client saying or being told you must select a, you know, insert name here, registered electrician to do the ICRs. That's not going to work because you go in and if you perform these one hour ICRs, the next person who will look at the system effectively, accurately, maybe an electrician putting in an electric vehicle charging outlet, it might be an electrician putting in some metering or some PV or even just a bit of a, a work. And if they see that you've got this recent inspection and they see faults that were not picked up, this kind of stuff could start happening regularly. And to be honest, if I was well equipped with an understanding on how to properly 
contact the local authority or whoever whoever to help oust this kind of practice, I would be motivated to help the client and get some of these electricians who are doing these one day, well, sorry, these one hour EICRs pulled in. Yeah, I mean, and to, don't get me wrong, I probably should have said this um, MC Electrical, um, by talking about this, we're not trying to throw anyone under the bus and I don't like to see anybody no. get prosecuted, but also part of me, knowing the bigger picture of the industry, I am pleased that the trading standards have taken this step because at the end of the day, when we go to work, we're there to protect ourselves, our family and people's homes. And if anybody listening disagrees with that, switch this podcast off because mm. I don't want you listening to it. It's not for you. This is about, you know, three pals having an engineering debate about what we think is a benefit to p- keep electricians and the public protected. Um, and I, had, I, I, saw, I saw a guy on LinkedIn uh, posting a job that was being advertised where the people had to do four EICRs a day with the employment model. If you're in a position where you've got to work and feed your family and you're having to work like this, what you can do is just raise concern with your employers, yeah. send this information to them. You know, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. It's real. You're, you're not, you should be verifying the paperwork. You're just the inspector at that point. You shouldn't be doing the, un, the underwritten verifying of the paperwork. Yeah. And it could be something as simple as um, if you speak to your bosses and you say, look, I need to put my concerns in writing. Mm. Just remember saying under regulation 29 of the electricity at work regulations. Excuse me, <clears throat> bit of wind. So if I go into 29 again and um, there is a webinar coming on this, by the way, but if I go to 29 right at the end and read my defence clause. OK, in any proceeding for any offence consistent of a controversial Contravi- contravention of regulations for now when you're doing EICRs whilst you are under the guise of the electricity at work regulations this guy wasn't prosecuted because it wasn't pertinent or relevant to there's nothing in the EAWR that talks about the task of EICR specifically there is maintenance there is inspection there's connecting of probes becoming part of the system safe systems of work working on or near life conductors but that's not sufficient to to underpin the the negligence the potential negligence Mm. that he was found guilty of by doing these now this chap may have been under massive pressure i don't know i don't know all the facts around it he may have been under massive pressure or that no we call it a normalization of deviance don't we that bad behavior may have been normal i can do four eicrs a day i'm the i'm the mutts nuts just stick a mega across it and away you go it's money for old rope and that's what creates the race to the bottom and the good guys lose out but the one thing i will say to sparks if you are concerned there's certain words that you've got to use in your emails now i've written these emails to a number of employees in my career and it says it shall be a defense for any person to prove he took all reasonable steps sending an email with your concern is reasonable steps to your employer that you took all due diligence to avoid the commissioning of that offence. So if you have a concern over the safety or the quality or whatever it is, all you have to do is write an email that basically says, I have real concerns over this. I don't think we're given uh, 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 enough time to do the, the work well. I think it leaves the home at risk. I think we are breaching our duty under the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations. Plus, it will lead to unsafe working practices, which is a breach of electricity at work regulations. And via this email, I am hereby discharging my duty of care under regulation 29 oh. and I think it's regulation 17. You put that in writing. I'm not saying it will, but if a judge or a lawyer or a solicitor sits there and says, this guy clearly told you he was discharging 29, discharging 17, you chose to ignore him. Thank you, Mr. Blank, blank, blank. Off you go. And then it will be the directors on the chopping block. So well, that, works, I, that, that works in all areas, though, even when I do duty holder training. It's a case of, you know, if you've got these responsibilities, if you cannot account for them or take ownership of them because of the powers that be above, connivance or whatever, then you put it down and you feed it up, obviously with recommendations as an engineer or as an expert as to what the solutions are up to the persons who make those decisions. And if you take that up there and then anything goes on, the problem goes up there with it, mm. you know? Um, interesting to add with this, there's a little there's a little line I just wanted to read from this report that John's pulled up here. Um, it says, um, when mem- this is from the councillor 
uh, one of the co uh, cabinet members of the public protection, uh, they said, when members of the public request the input of professionals, they deserve to be able to rely on the information received. Absolutely. You know, you need to really just think about what tenants, homeowners, customers, whatever you want to call them, members of the public or ordinary persons as we need to define them, they rely on us as professionals to give them all of our ability and our professionalism. Not what we can squeeze into the hour or so that we need to. I'm going to throw something controversial in chaps. I mean. Would that have happened if he was registered with NAPIT or the NICEIC? Well, what's the difference? Well, except, well Stromer yeah. obviously don't exist anymore because they were purchased by NAPIT. NAPIT, right, yeah. But, but I'm just wondering, was yeah. that, is there a potential that that prosecution was brought on because he was registered with now a defunct CPS? Oh, so you're saying that as there wasn't a CPS to kind of... There wasn't a CPS to hold accountable right. because the purchase of Stromer would have involved the physical assets and the brand to close. Maybe. So that brand is gone. So there's nobody it's, in theory to prosecute. Because it's worth mentioning that, what, three, four years ago, we were talking with a, a close electrician friend of ours who was having an issue down south with a yes. customer that had a big issue in a home that he just bought. But Stromer were an active company at the time. They and it went, it went nowhere, really, with them. It did. But in fairness, the guy had not paid his membership fees. And because he hadn't paid his membership fees, he was... Pff, Hmm. The minute, obviously, you go to him, has he paid his fees? Nope, not a Stroma man then. He's gone. Hmm. That's it. But again, going, back to, this, going back to this um, prosecution here, this is all about, you know, the public provide, you know, the, the public contacting an expert for services and expecting yeah. to be able to rely on the output of that professional's report to then purchase a property. She purchased a property on the basis of that report. So what did his website say that this electrician offered? Oh, yeah, well, honestly, we won't name the company or repeat his name or anything like that. But it, yeah. it is a general electrical contractor. What sort of other services did he do? Was he commercial? Was he industrial? Was maybe was it an industrial spark who maybe did a domestic EICR? Was that maybe the root cause? So it'd be worth worth now knowing again, because we, we, you know, we're reading up on this as as we're doing this. We're, we're not trying to judge it's, or, it's or make assumptions domestic. here. We're just. Yeah, mostly domestic based. Looking at this, testing, testing, okay. people charging outside. Everyone uh, does it now. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah anyone with sockets right. and EV installed and out. There's a there's a there's a directory page here that's got him down as an expert witness, electrician as well. Which an is expert witness. I don't know if that's fluff or if that's real. I'm I'm gonna I'm the cynic in me. <laughs> mm, maybe not. Maybe. Maybe not, because if he's an expert witness, he should be able to literally at any point reel off. Oh, that's a breach of four. That's a breach of eight. And if he has done expert witness, he should know what the court is like. So for those listening and watching, if you ever do go to a court, I, I've witnessed one or two um, cases where it's quite interesting because you think it's going to be this big, huge kerfuffle. And generally what happens is the barrister, the solicitors will come in, the judge will open. And he'll basically say, right, in, in the uh, case against, I don't know, you know, Mr. Smith, electrical, blah, 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 blah. Um, the, 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 the prosecution, um, what's your opening statement? They'll say, oh, we have uh, an incident where Joe Bloggs has been received an electric shock. We are pushing for a, a, a breach of a secondary breach of four, eight and 12 of electricity at work regs and primary breach of three of mm. Health and Safety Work Act. And to most people, you'll sit there and listen and go, what the hell does all that mean? <clears throat> but what they're doing is they're saying it's actually a secondary breach of electricity work regs, but we're going to do them under Health and Safety at Work Act, providing a safe workplace because it's it's got a higher authority in law, um, fee fines and all the rest of it. And it's far more embarrassing when you're prosecuted by the act rather than the regulations here. What they've done is they've looked probably at electricity work regs and then found the consumer protection from unfair trading, the outputs is what they're going to nail him on rather than the electricity at work regs, where the electricity at work regs, uh, they don't cater. And the trouble is, is electricians today look to a book to give them the answers and not to their brain first to analyze and, and, and find out where their understanding is to give them the answers. EICRs yeah. are only a part of a huge book and not many pages in a huge book. 
but again, we've come, we've caught this problem where it's a bit like patch testing, where we've taken, we've taken the thought process out of the work and we've just gone to an address and we're filling in a form. It's like address form, address form, address form. And one of the things that we often dismiss from or we don't talk about enough is the importance of the inspection over the testing. And we'll fly around and we'll take some sample inspections or some sample values. We'll close the paperwork up. We'll move on to the next one. Dave, I, I, I've always said, and I, I'm probably going to get a lot of hates for this, but I've always said when I was in management, the amount of people that used to have the email or the job title test and inspection manager. And the first yeah. thing I would say is you haven't got a clue what you're doing because you yeah. never test before you inspect. Yeah. And the worst thing is when you spoke to them, they would go, we're going to go test him. What are you doing? Oh, I was going to do a ZS. And you're going to do an inspection first. Aren't you going to ascertain the rating condition in the equipment to make sure the bonding's in place? Aren't you going to? I'm not saying you, by the way, you have to do, you know, check the bonding every single time, but 13216, don't make all races additions. So if you're there, you know, when you're doing your electrical installation condition report, don't you start with a visual inspection? Ascertain the safety of the installation of a visual before. Have you ever done an EICR, Dave? where it's been so bad visually, you haven't even bothered to test. I haven't got the testers out the van sometimes, mate. Yep, same here. What's the point? What's the That's point? same here. But now what you, I've I've seen guys, and, and I don't understand this, and I was, what scares me is, is apparently in the on-site guide, um, it, it, it talks about allowing you to calculate ZS methods and all sorts, which is just yeah. dumb. It's dumb. I'm sorry. I'm not yeah. trying to throw anyone under a bus, but I wasn't taught that. I was taught. The only times you work live is obviously when you're proving live or dead and when you're doing tests, um, ZS, RCD, etc. You work on or near live conductors and that should yeah. that's norm. But, but again, they need to keep they need to keep dampening down that because there are many people with lacking of experience who are doing this work now. That's fairly evident. Yes, yeah. it, there's a conundrum around it and I'm not going into a safe isolation debate either, by the way. I'm just more thinking about um, people are going and doing form filling basically what i'm finding with eicrs and i've seen a lot they fill out a board schedule they do a zs and a fault current and that's it the rest of it they'll just put a mega test result down and wing it 299 when mm -hmm. you look at their mega kit you look at their mega kit and you go yeah 299 they stopped doing that years ago and you've got a brand new mft which goes to 999 so you're, you're so sloppy and lazy that you've not actually ir'd it you've just assumed the ir is fine otherwise you get loads of faults and trips and all sorts IRs are very lazy test, but these EICRs, you got people, and I've spoken to electricians that have done this. They literally go out, fill in the board schedule, have a quick look around, ZS, PFC, ZE if they're lucky, job done. That's an EICR satisfactory. Now in a house, that may actually be enough for some houses, depending on the extent of the inspection and the testing and the competency of the inspector. Dave, I've said to you many a time, you walk into a house within five, 10 minutes looking at the intake, you'll know you'll yeah, just yeah, yeah. know once you get that board cover on whether it's passing or it's failing mm -hmm. um but yeah electricity at work regs it's it's a funny one so do you think that we need more prosecutions specifically under the eawr to make the industry realize that we need to possibly do more learning and understanding on electricity at work regs mm, i think we do i mean the a lot of the problem with most of the prosecutors have done under it seem to be when someone's been seriously injured or killed, which yeah. is kind of a bit too late because it's that's yeah. like the, the ultimate extreme end of something's gone horribly wrong. But of course, there must be loads of other stuff where like near misses and all kinds of other stuff has happened, but it's never actually prosecuted or anything else. So this whole idea that, oh, you've killed three people, so now we're going to prosecute you is kind of too late, isn't it? It's not really solving a problem. And maybe that's maybe that. Do you know what, John? That's a really valid point. Maybe we don't learn the electricity or work regs enough because we assume there are other safety nets like BS76M1. We assume that if we can just follow that blue book, then we won't need to learn it. I remember when I was younger learning electricity or work regs and everybody struggled on a lot of it with the exception of, you know, the usual space light, ventilation, isolation, you know, it was it, they taught you maybe five or six numbers. And that was it. But it the never really is, taught you the intent. The frustrating thing there, Paul, is I mean, HSR 25 is easy to free, easy to download free. I mean, we, I've bought mine, you've bought yours. But um, it's got great guidance and it reads well. It know? does. And you can 
quote, what I love about it is every paragraph of information, you can quote it. So mm. I can quote paragraph 63 in this book and someone can find it straight away. Um, mm. This is actually more thumb through than my regs book now. I, I read this, the law, um, more than I do. And I, I'm, I'm, always, th I'm always in that and I'm always in HSG85, which is your safe systems of work or safe working practices. I'm always yeah. in those two. So uh, again, I'm going to use this podcast to repeat for guys who are in management or in sparking or trainees or learners i strongly advise you to go on a journey where and we will do a we will do a webinar on this later this month where we will look at chapter 13 of the wine regulations which is six pages and 53 regs and the electricity at work regs and i learn in my opinion and it's only my opinion a great way of when you look at a regulation try and map that regulation to an electricity at work reg number when you do you will by default go into cruise control and understand the law behind the regulation. When you do that, you will find you're working from the intention of the reg, not struggling and arguing over how do I comply with a regulation, which is just guidance. Um, so, yeah, now on that HSG 20 HSR 25 apologies, which is this wonderful book. Um, do you think I'm going to open this question now. I'm slightly biased because um, one of my voluntary jobs, I'm chairman of the Electrical Safety Roundtable and I've mentioned it. Do we think that this, and I will put a link in the YouTube thing if you don't know how to Google HSR25, um, do you think this needs an update? The law or the guidance note for the electricity work rigs? What do you think, John? Well, I think the law itself is OK. Yeah. But... Most of what this document is, is actually a load of paragraphs written about how you're supposed to use it and whatever else. And it's quite old and some of the language in it is not exactly ideal. So, yeah, I think some of it does need certainly updating. What do you think, Dave? It can do with a bit of an update, but I think what's more important is that we bring it more into training opportunities and Actually, instead of just having two or three slides that mention it alongside other legislations, pure management health and safety at work, health and safety work act umbrella, you know, that period of a training journey when you've got that legislation session, there should be dedicated efforts to study and actually use the electricity work regulations with regards to an electrician's work from the perspective of installation, design, maintenance. There should be an effort in the training strategy to break that document down because the way it's written now it can be done that way it could do with a little update but I think if we just update it we're not using it properly so if we just update it it still might not make much of an impact so I will really use it better I'll do a political spin on this um, this was updated this HSR 25 was updated in 2015 for the third time so the yes. guidance is updated but this is now nearly seven years old this okay. version of the book the electricity at work regulations, they're the same, 1989, mm. but the guidance has progressed. So someone in the HSC has said, yes, this does need an update. Now, I look at seven years ago to today, I look at Instagram, smart home, battery storage, prosumer coming, and I'm thinking this book really could do with an update based on modern methods, modern techniques, modern technology, and how that maps into the intent of the electricity at work rate. Because you look at the electricity at work regulations, and I don't think at all in any way, shape or form that these, these need to be updated. There's enough in there um, well, that still to, covers need, everything. Yeah, and they still need to, they need to stay broad because we can't make them too specific because we need to remember they're not just for electricians. Yeah. They're for all people who work with or near or adjacent to electricity. Every workplace. Yes. You know, um, so as they are written themselves, yes, I think it's the guidance itself, the little the little paragraphs that we could improve with. It's worthwhile noting as well, in, in my professional opinion, as a chartered fellow at the IET, this document, this book applies to every single electrician in the country. And if you don't think it does, I'm sorry, you're wrong, mm. in my opinion. If you are a house basher and you are self-employed, you are at work, you are paying yourself a wage. This is the electricity at work regulations. <laughs> So when you are selecting, erecting your installation, you must ensure you comply and certify to 7671, which is deemed compliance with this. Now you don't have to sit 
lifting up floorboards, mumbling regulation numbers to you. But you have to understand the intent because while you're there selecting and erecting, you will meet this. Once you certify and leave, then the home is not under the guise of the electricity work regulations. It's under the guise of the homeowner. Part of fixed fabric and it should be safe. And the homeowner may want to maintain it, may not want to maintain it, may wish to do DIY, may not. There's not really much that stops them other than Part P, and we know how light and fluffy Part P actually is since mm. it came out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I think this needs an update. I'd like to see more about prosumer and battery storage. I know, obviously, the regulations covering it, but I, I, I think just looking at the headings, I think we could update regulation four. I think we could update eight, because especially with the foundation electrode stuff coming. I think we could probably update 11 and 12, because now with more multiple supplies, battery storage, stored energy, mm. I think that could do with a bit. Yeah. Um, maybe eight. Other than that, I, I, yeah, and that's just guidance, by the way, not the actual law, just the explanatory guidance to give people a maybe an example or a little bit more clarity that yes, we're referencing this modern technology. So, if anyone from the HSC is watching, they're probably not, but <laughs> I will have a word at my next ESR because we do have a HSC representative sat on that, and he is quite a quite adamant that the EAWR does not need to be updated. Period. What needs to be updated is people's knowledge, education and training of it. But as we've said in many a podcast, guys, we're swimming in standards, swimming in law and standards and the duty on the person who does not know. Scary I guess stuff. I guess here's, I guess the point is, like I, I said that we need to deliver it and train better with it and use it more. And the, the problem is that will always be the excuse. It won't get improved until we've improved our, the way that we use it. And I, I can imagine the HSC will constantly say, oh, you need to use it better. You need to study it better. You need to know it better before they actually make it any better. I expect that they may throw that back. I agree. I agree. And just for those listening, a little, little few facts here. So electricity at work regulations were actually written on the 7th of April 1989, hence 4th EOW 1989. But they came into force the 1st of April 1990. Um, I always wondered why they weren't called EAWR 1990, but... That's that's just, just the way it that. works, really. Um, they are a secondary piece of legislation. The primary legislation that sits above them is an act of parliament. And then to enable that act to be met, they then have regulations to sit under it, like construction design management regulations and uh, provision and use of workplace equipment regulations. So it's almost like a hierarchical pyramid. Um, but EAWR is the one that reg electricians are taught of uh, rather regularly. Um, and, and also, just to be clear, if, and I, I used to do this as an order, if you breach electricity at work regulations, you could then immediately open up another set of regulations like the management of health and safety at work regulations mm -hmm. and say, because you didn't provide a safe system of work, you're also in breach of regulation three or five or nine of management of health and safety at work regs, which also requires you to manage risk. And, and I'll quote what I, I had a scaffolder teach me my IOSH managing safely, first health and safety course I ever did. And this is going to be quite blunt, so forgive the brutalness, but the guy was a scaffolder, so anyone in the trades will know. He stood up in front of the class, and there was 20 site engineers, and he went, Health and Safety at Work Act, load of old rubbish. I'm like, what? He said, Electricity at Work Rigs, load of old rubbish. Pure, load of old rubbish. CDM, load of old rubbish. And he listed off COSH regulations and all this other stuff. And every time he just said, load of old rubbish, management, health and safety work rates, load of old rubbish. Do you know why they're all load of old rubbish? And we went, why? He said, because nobody bothers reading the Health and Safety at Work Act and nobody understands it. So all we do is we create loads of sub regulations just to keep spinning it and keep putting more emphasis on working at height regulations because people can understand the intent of the broad maintain plant equipment a safe workplace make sure you protect the health and safety of your workers of your employees and of visitors that's oh what, what does that mean to me and people like to be told what to do and that's why these regulations as well come into factor and i i know from having spoken to a few um senior people at hsc that what they will do sometimes is they'll do a refresh of the regulation purely because of obviously precedences and case studies and stuff but also to bring it back up to the forefront of the hearts and minds of people. 
So you can imagine if we did a EAWR guidance note update, there'd probably be a big social media campaign nowadays, probably not seven years ago, where they say, hey, guidance has been updated, everybody. This is the time to put yourself on a training course to re-familiarise yourself with the latest intent of applying these regulations. I don't see it as a bad thing. I know it's quite political, but anything that gets people back in the classroom, retraining, refreshing, to me can only be a good thing. Just, just my yeah. personal view. What do you think, boys? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> You're just overwhelmed uh, by that, aren't you? It's, that it's, impassioned it's, plea. It's, it's a case of just trying to think how we can develop a better relationship with the regs. Or, oh, sorry, not the regs, the literacy of work regs. Um, to actually then, you know, know them and use them. And let's not forget that this podcast, you know, the, the reason we decided to do the short one is actually because of the different regulations. And maybe we need to also start to familiarise ourselves with these, because if these can be used to push us to actually, you know, provide proper services, then that can really be a good thing as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's probably one thing we could probably summarise on. The consumer protection from unfair trading regulations, if you Google SI1277, which is statutory instrument, mm. you'll find a fully searchable version online. And just the headings on part one, two, three, four, five is quite scary. Misleading emissions, misleading yeah. actions, prohibition of unfair commercial practices. So and this is the kind of stuff that you could get done for false advertising. Exactly. Fundamentally, what's happening here is a client has been told you need a thing, need an inspection, you need a product. You've contacted a, you know, a person who claims to be a professional. Yeah. You've got their services. The client doesn't know how long they should take. I remember the NICIC did have an article trying to advise people and they dared to say how long they should take. And I think they said like, two and a half hours or so. And I don't no, like that. They shouldn't be issuing this, that sort of guidance should, at all. No, but this is what they've done because they get that question all the time. But, you know, the, cli the client at the end of the day is basically, um, you know, committed to whatever you say it will take. Um, they can get some opinions. But if your client approaches you, asks for a service, and you commit to del delivering the whole service, you don't add any limitations that you must agree with the client obviously but the client so the client takes over the fact that they know you're not going to be checking this you're not going to be checking that you know you're not going to check the pv or the ev or whatever because you haven't got the testers for it as long as they agree that that's fine at the beginning and they sign that that uh, limitation as an agreed limitation then they still know what they're getting mm -hmm. the client must know what they're getting and if you think that what they want is a satisfactory then whilst landlords and others may have that attitude homeowners or most clients don't they want the right job they want the proper job and now with this, with this precedence now if they then get another electrician to come in to do other work how many times have we done a job and we've looked at the paperwork from the previous or we've looked at the condition and have realized it's been passed so many times but now we Sadly, have this precedence. dave a lot of the sparks listening to this will turn around and go yeah but it's the race to the bottom cash is king cheap 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 landlords estate agents managing agents the estate agents i think are terrible i i've i've experienced estate agents in my own personal uh, world and they don't have the competency to understand what they're requesting on behalf of the landlord right my old, man, done. my old man yeah he, he has a flat his letting agent right he didn't. He, he was. He was going to change his tenancy, and his his letting agent said, "You got to get an inspection." Then he went, "Oh, okay." He did an inspection of his own flat. He failed it. He gave his failure to his letting agent. Nice. They said to him, "We'll get someone else." You joking? His, no, seriously. He yes, actually. Flat. He, he, yeah, he wanted to see what happened. He failed his own flat. He gave them the paperwork, and then obviously someone in the office wrote back to him as the tenant or as the customer, we'll "Get someone else." I, I, I wish to God, and I think I said this to them before COVID, I really wish to God the NIC or, or the likes would do a campaign teaching landlords about these sorts of rogue experiences, this race to the bottom. I, I, I would love to challenge the industry to say, because we've had messages from people that have been offered EICRs at £35 a pop. 
which is an utter disgrace. And I will challenge the whole industry, the IET, the NIC, the ECA, the JIB, everybody, unite the lot to put out a statement that's, that absolutely condemns this approach to not I, giving the spark sufficient time and money to do a thorough and competent inspection. I honestly believe, and this is just me, not all of you saying this, but I honestly believe that over the 10, 15 years of what we've had, that <clears throat> CPS are not in a position now where they can really stand up tall and say, we will fix this because our membership is strong enough. I don't think the CPS have confidence in their own members. I don't disagree with that. Uh, I don't so, disagree with it. So I don't think that they could really take these campaigns forward too much. No, I don't. I, 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 I can't disagree with that. I don't see sufficient evidence in their acts and omissions to do that. But I do wish, given their marketing clout, they could easily do a one pager. That's you know, their strength now. That's what they've built up, isn't it? What, what what are you looking for? Where's the information for the landlords, for the letting agents? Yeah, OK, they can find they can market their brand, NAPIT, NIC, etc. And that's fine. That's fine. But at least say, look, um, a proper EICR, I'd say a one bedroom flat, two bedroom flat is at least half a day, at least half a day. If you have an electrical contractor doing three or four a day, ain't happening. You're not getting anything substantial. Yeah. This is going to cost at least five six hours of electrician's time for anything below 250 quid is just a waste of time mm -hmm. pretty much i mean I, i'm just you know, if i do residentials i'm looking at if it's three bedrooms plus i'm looking at a day's money yeah so that i can actually put the time in and often i'm going home and i'm carrying on the paperwork i work more than that anyway you know anything smaller yeah, I mean, then we could probably position it to half a day my mother-in-law had an Listen. eicr done on her house and the remedials in the same day and the electrician put a 13 hour day in yeah. and with all the remedials he made about just over 500 quid in any eicr satisfactory eicr but he was there in the in the full day that mm. bloke was actually really good mm. his eicr weren't that bad at all this was by the way i'll just repeat this 25 years ago yeah. when i just started college so I was watching him while he was doing it. So I was yeah. trying to learn. Unfortunately, very conscientious. Most, most people listening are probably going, it's just not like that now, guys. It's just not like that. Yep. Uh, we know. I know um, I'm fat, I'm great, I'm old. What can you do? But uh, we're yeah. just chewing the fat and reminiscing the old days. Speaking yeah. of the old days. What's that? We've got some webinars coming up. Yeah. And one of them's going to oh, be yeah. about the old days. Is that? Um, yes, what, that's, that's the one coming up. Is that after this podcast is launched or? I don't know when these go out anymore. I don't know. So we're doing a we're, we're just just to be clear, we'll we'll round this up now anyway because it's only a short one. We have got a list of stuff to do. Um, a lot of them are taking a lot of research and a lot more time. It is what it is. There may be weeks where there is no podcast. Apologies if you're expecting it weekly, but we're just going to kind of just we'll try. If not, we're not going to lose any sleep over it. Um, the webinars are about to start again. They take a lot of work and effort. Uh, and their lives, so we're going to be focusing on them. But um, we have had some requesting for stuff. It does involve a lot of research. It may not be this side of Christmas. It may not be ever. Who knows? It, it literally all depends on whether we've all got the time to read up on it and think it's interesting. But more importantly, I don't really want to talk about stuff I'm not competent on. That's the key, isn't it? I can, but <laughs> I won't offer anyone a service here. We can offer it like we always do. Well, at the end of the day, everything we're talking about now is our own personal opinions, not you know generalizations or, or slander of anybody it's just a personal opinion free mates having a chat about engineering and industry there's certain things that i've been asked to do i mean like the one on hot tubs i'm not really confident now i've never installed a hot tub i ain't got the money to install a hot tub so i don't feel confident of doing it but if you guys feel confident doing it we can chew the fat of it i'd rather point people to articles in magazines where there's more information and i was just saying i mean pete monford's written an article in pe I think other guys have written articles. It's been, it's, it's been a number of articles. Maybe they want our opinion on those. Yeah. Um, the problem, yeah, the problem with hot tubs is there's you can't just say this is how you do it because each installation is different. You've got to take into account a whole lot of factors. So I've done some of them, but okay. they're, they're none of them are actually the same. And the, 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 you can't say just say do this because that could be wrong in some cases. It could be exactly right in another. So. Or well, maybe like, maybe we can plan a podcast and go through some examples of hot tubs. Yeah. Maybe we can do a podcast where JW is in the hot tub. In the hot tub. In the where well, we got all the bubbles going, and you're just sitting there going, mm, "No, I don't think so." 
That would be an interesting one. E5 podcast with JW in the hot tub. No, that's just strange. Um, yeah, so we've got stuff coming up. So please bear with us. Um, if if you're liking any of these, you can put comments down below and we'll look at them eventually at some point. Um, but we do appreciate everything. And, I, and I've kind of, apologies, I've been a bit lackluster on some of these. Um, since we've stopped doing the podcast, and I should have mentioned it in the last one, all the messages on Instagram and on the YouTube channel and all that sort of stuff they're very very much appreciated we've had some really kind messages uh, which is great um we'll try our best to meet all of your expectations it's all we can ever do um but we'll do these and enjoy doing them yeah. and if we don't enjoy doing them we won't we won't yeah. simple as that but we'll we'll meet our obligations we'll meet the promises we've made you'll still see us around for a good few months um but apologies if it's not every week it's all time dependent and john works and dave works and i work and we're all really busy because christmas is coming and end of year and all that other good jazz right lads have you got anything to summarize on eawr uh, or no I th- I'm, I'm happy with with um with with this were we going to talk about an amendment or an adjustment to last week's batch or are you going to do it another time no let's do it now so hang on stop Hash, hashtag 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 Corrigendum. So we did a, a, a podcast on Thatch Properties, and it may have been the last one or the one, I don't know. Um, but we did it, and there were some really interesting comments from, from very smart people. Cause very good ones. From the Discord. We Coming from the Discord. Keen um, to just get through it and listen to John's wonderful <laughs> narration of it, that we missed some bits. Dave, what were the bits we missed again? I haven't read them, man. I don't know. You just told me. Oh, f- and that's just to- that just shows you how much we wing these. Um, all- can you please get the comments up so we can read them so that Mr. Right, Betteridge... Right it was Mr. Betteridge, was it? Was it on the YouTube video? Yeah, well, in fairness, we mentioned, obviously, the Dorset model. We yeah. mentioned the um, the document, uh, the little A5 pamphlet mm-hmm. thing that you can print out. Um, okay. There's obviously another document that I think PNX highlighted to us, which is basically the Dorset model and all kind of yeah, stuff yeah, we spoke he about. He done that, that out really quickly, didn't he? That was good. That was very good, actually, yeah, because it literally came out and he, he was saying, you, yeah, you need to do this. But there was a section of the Warren regulations, and I I can't remember because it's really late on a uh, blank night. Oh, hang on. He's, recording these. Are his comments on my channel or your one? I think they're was, on my one. There was two documents which were put out. One was from the, the um, National Society of Master Thatchers, yeah. who do thatch roofs, so <laughs> they are used to these things. Um, <laughs> And then there was another one, uh, which was another article, which uh, again gave some additional information as well. Uh, so uh, there were so a couple of other articles there because this right. whole thatch roof thing, there isn't like one central document you can go to and say this has all the stuff in. It's sort of spread across various different places and different industries. Yeah, the other one was from uh, Electrical Safety First, one of their editions from uh, spring 2015. Which again had some uh, useful information in there about. How their thatch roofs are actually constructed and when they put like big metal pins through to hold the mm-hmm. roof together and whatever because obviously you don't want those stabbing through your wiring and things because again that's just another cause of uh, damage there so yeah we'll right i've got these in the usual place so i've got mr betteridge's comment hi dave yeah hi dave um all right hi chat's been listening this may have been mentioned i was thinking of reg 422.4 yeah, with addition to section 421. So he's in chapter 42, protecting against thermal effects. 421 is equipment, 422 is locations with risk of fire. Um, right, locations would fall within this into CA2. So he's talking about the external influence category of CA2, which is what's that? It's, uh, buildings. CA2 conditions exist where a building is mainly constructed of combustible materials such as wood. Yeah. See Appendix 5, external influences. You remember that appendix, the one that loads of people don't bother reading. Appendix 5. Yes, yeah. external in, influences. Yeah, he he then references to HT six zero three six four 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 two. That's just seven six seven one. Well, so, yeah, and, and the thing is, is you, you, people, when we were talked about the thatch documents, precautions should be taken. Electrical equipment to not ignite floors, walls, or ceilings. Prefabricated hollow walls, pre-installed wiring systems, accessories, etc., should be IP three X, where the wall is drilled. You've then got um, even in four two two one. Uh, requirements of uh, let me see if I can read this. The electrical equipment should be selected against normal temperature rise, foreseeable temperature rise during a fault cannot cause a fire. 
You've then got obviously the arc fault stuff. You've then got locations with risk of fire due to the nature of process of store materials. Not really relevant to thatch, but some right. of the guidance in it is very, very pertinent. Um, I think, you. Yeah, I, I, IP3X gets mentioned a lot when there's um, risk of um, fire propagating. It's so, um, mentioned for, in a number of warning um, systems. If I go to 42114 is another relevant one. Mm -hmm. It's got me going now. Yeah, Fixed sorry. equipment causing a concentration and focusing of heat shall be a significant distance from any fixed object or building element. Yeah. Um, so it's not subjected to dangerous temperature and normal conditions. So if anybody watched our last podcast on thatch buildings and thought, well, it's a guidance note from obscure thatchers, 7671's got the answers. You've just got to be able to read that and go, well, that's relevant to me. Mm -hmm. I have to protect from external influences, the rats, the mice, the heat generated from equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So 421 and 422, fantastic little bits. And here end of the Corrigendum. The Corrigendum. And well done, David, because, you know, you are you're, you're, you're almost as bad as me with the red split these days, buddy. Yeah, well done, sir. So it's um, really good. we're not going to get all these perfect, so apologies. Um, we're not trying to be perfectionists, in all fairness. We're just chit-chatting. But when we saw the comment, we just thought, you know what? Very pertinent, very relevant. Um, so on that bombshell, I think we're going to end it, lads. Any final thoughts? <coughs> I'm good. Yep, that's, I think we've covered it all. So that will do. Yeah. Everybody watching, look after yourself. Take care of yourself. Um, thank you very much for listening or watching or whatever platform you're on. You can click and like or not. Hey, it is what it is. Uh, and until the next one, take care of yourself and each other. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.